So identifying plants, how do you tell them apart? So we'll take you back right to university and you're going to be starting right from the basics. These are the steps you want to be able to memorize and know them just offhand. When you look at a plant, you want to know if they're monocots or dicots. Is there any other groups? Can anybody tell me of another group of plants outside of monocots and dicots that are important here? Bryophytes. And bryophytes, non-vasculars are another, they're important. With some of the dicots, with flowers, you need to have a microscope to be successful for a lot of the bryophytes. You can spot ID a certain select group, but when you're talking about 20 different sphagnums, there is a lot to know. How about gymnosperms? Anybody know what those are? Anybody tell me a major species in one of those groups, in that group? Pine. You're talking about your conifers. So they don't fit into this. So starting with monocots. With monocots, we're basically looking, parallel leaf venation is the, one of the nicest places to start, but pay attention because sometimes you can get ones with a parallel leaf venation with webbing in between and they're dicots. So sometimes they can flip improperly. Also, tree rings, that's more of a dicot type of thing or gymnosperm. Monocots will have these vascular bundles. So if you actually break bamboo a cross section of it and look at it, it looks different than what you're going to see in your normal tree rings. But the main thing for monocot is one cot leading emerging from the leaf versus two. If you're working with seed, that's going to be something you're going to look at a lot. If you're working outside in a crop field or in a native grassland or a forest, that's not something you're going to be paying attention to because that's not there. <laughs> Look for also the flowers. The flowers will be grouped in threes and sixes in your monocots, where in your dicots you're looking in groups of fours and fives. So starting off in monocots, we break into three groups. Again, this is where you want to be able to get to a point where you feel like you can just solidly jump to each one of these groups and you know what group, what plants are in each one. So Poyaceae grasses, uh, you want to be looking for, is there, your, you look for the ligules, the oracles, you have everything is set in um, two versus when you go into the Cypraceae, the sedges, you're going to have groupings of three in the sedges, but when you get, be careful because everybody uses, sedges have edges, but so do bulrushes. A lot of the bulrushes will have three-sided stems as well. So just because it's a three-sided stem does not mean that you have a sedge but it does mean you don't have a grass. So you have something there you can work with. And then when you get into the rushes, junk AC8, that's another grouping again that you're gonna break apart. So we'll start in grasses. So grasses, you're gonna be looking at your culms. You have nodes and they're distinctive. And if everybody's seen a node, we'll show some pictures of them. It's that hard bump on the flower stem that you'll see going up and then you have your internode, the big expansion area in between them. You're, they're going to be very distinct, where in Cyperaceae and Juncaceae, you do not see them, they're indistinct. When we look at the blades, we're going to have two ranked in the Poyaceae versus the three ranked in Sedges, ver versus again the ju Juncaceae, in, um, which you're not going to see the three ranked either. So, sheaths, um, you're going to have them split or you're going to have them closed. When you have a closed sheath in a grass, you've eliminated almost everything. You're almost down to a brome. There's a few species that have closed sheaths. Now, when we're talking about a closed sheath, we're not talking about whether it coming down and overlapping. It has to come down and actually merge together the sheath. And a lot of people will mistake an overlapping sheath for a closed one. Many of the open ones are overlapping. And I'll show pictures again. So if you're not quite sure what I'm talking about yet, we'll get into that in a few minutes. Ligules, um, you're going to see a lot of different variations of ligules in your grasses. This is where I like to identify my grasses, is working on the ligules, the collar, and the oracles, because you do not always have a flower head. When you don't have flower heads, because <coughs> there's grazing, all, they're young, like these ones here, you're not going to be able to use a flower head here. So this here is an exercise in how you deal with not having all the things you need for a lot of the other keys that require a flower head you can identify all grasses with the vegetative ability. 
So ligules, um, you're not going to really see them in your sedges. You can pretty much ignore them. Collars, they're very distinct. They're varying. They're different colors. You have different hair patterns on them. <clears throat> the collar region is where your blade and your sheath connect. So the blade of leaf coming back into the plant. Um, oracles come off right there in the ligules. So oracles are your little claws clasping. Again, you're going to be present or absent on grasses, and they're going to be varying in size, color, shape, and deciduous or not. So in late season, they can actually fall off. So you have to be paying attention in grasses because an old leaf could actually have the oracles start falling off. So you need to look at the whole plant and multiple plants. Don't just take one blade and assume you've got everything you need to know. So that is, and that goes for every part of identifying grasses. We're talking about something where there's a genetic variation in the population. And so not every key is going to have every factor. Um, if you're dealing with hay crops, tame species, Keys don't work well, it doesn't matter what type of key you're using because they continually are breeding species for different characteristics and when they do that, they might be breeding for more seed production but they'll change the size of the seed, the shape of the seed, they'll change the ligules, they'll change the width of the leaves and so all of those type of factors change in our forage crops and other type of spe um, tame species. Weeds can have some of those type of things happen too when you have wild oats, fast turnover where the genetic changes can actually change at a very quick rate. So know the type of species you're working with and if there could be variation in them. We had one uh, meadow brome variety that was a cross between smooth brome and meadow brome. So it was exhibiting rhizomes, it was exhibiting characteristics of both. So you can have all of those type of variations depending on what you're dealing with. So. Getting into the grasses, we have our, this is using the old system of naming. I like using it because it breaks it by what they look like. So when you're in the field, the old systems of naming are going to be how you break things down. <clears throat> if you're using the new names, you basically have to go into groups, subgroups, basically using the same categories, and, and then you can group things together. Because now your Elemises and Agripyrans have been intermixed. So Agripyron used to have one characteristic and Elmus the other. Now if you use the new naming system, they, they all intermix. So the tribes have very distinctive characteristics in grasses. It's good to learn your tribes if you have the time. So these are the terms that you're going to want to know and what you'll be working with today. So starting in, we've gotten a really, really unique plant here because it's got stolen rhizomes, everything. So when I was talking about the collar region, you have that little um, subset on the side there, it has the blade at the top, the ligule in the back there right against the blade. The ligule will be um, papery white a lot of times. It can be frayed, it can be a pointed tip, acute or acuminate. It can have uh, truncated where it's a flat top. All those variations, how long it is, are going to be critical and you'll have to be able to measure. So when you're in the field, you want to have a ruler, you want to have a hand lens, and generally, um, you want to have something you can do into 0.5 millimeters because that's the size you're going to be actually working at. Oracles then come clasping out at the sheath and clasps around the stem. And then you can see the node and comb up at the top. Um, for today, we will not be going into seed heads, so you don't have to know that today. Um, very useful to have. It, when I'm keying out and you're not sure of a plant, run the seed head key, run the vegetative key. If things are matching up, you probably have a good shot that you're right. But if things are not matching up, then you've got to start questioning what you, if you did something wrong. So rhizomes. Uh, rhizomes are an underground stem. So they will have a leaf sheath on them. So they're going to have things that look like a collar region on them. They won't have the oracles, ligules, and that, but you'll see a blade coming off, all of that. You're looking for that to find a rhizome. Stolens are an above ground root. So a stolen is like a strawberry run runner. There are grasses that have those, and there's grasses that have something almost in between a rhizome and a stolen. Because what happens with Phragmites australis, uh, Poa palustris, they actually will, the stems will fall over and root at the nodes. And so it becomes an above ground root, but it actually came from a flowering stem. So um, I've heard of stories of Phragmites australis in Ontario falling over a fence and rooting on the other side of the fence. So when you get 
grasses that can be three meters tall, they can do some really fun things with rooting. Um, I've also knocked a stem down on our farm of that species and it just kept growing along the ground and rooting and it, would, it went I think four meters long along the ground just continuing to root. So <clears throat> you can actually, some of these plants will turn into a stoloniferous plant. As I mentioned, the collar region, that's going to be our real focus. You can see where the collar comes off on the blade and you want to really remember those parts. So when we look at parts of them, you can see here the ligule little papery, it's hard to see, but this is a fairly long ligule. And then here you can see the oracles coming out, so little claws coming out. There's your sheath, and then there's the blade. So in here, you got a really hairy collar. If you see a hairy collar, pay attention, that eliminates a lot of grasses. If the ligule is a ring of hairs, there's no membrane, just a ring of hairs, you're down to almost two species in Alberta. Blue grama grass and Calma vilfolongifolia are kind of the main ones you're going to see in some of that. If you see a really long ligule in the grassland, so if you're out in the prairies, you're <coughs> going around the grassland and you see a grass that looks like a wheat grass, but it has this massive ligule and no oracles, you've got plains reed grass. It is probably one of the most underreported grasses in the prairies because it doesn't flower very often. So it creeps along throughout the grassland, spread out everywhere, and there'll be individual stems. And all the IDing features that you really have are, does that have a rhizome? No oracle has a ligule. And there you've got it. But that tells you how hard it can be, so a lot of people will not report that species, even though <coughs> it is in almost every grassland. So, ligules. Accumulate versus truncate. So accumulate, you're going for your pointed. Truncate is cut off, so it's truncated. So it's a flat top. Obtuse versus acute, so is it a rounded accumulate? So accumulate would be up and then to a little point. Then you can have obtuse where it's a rounded, or you can have acute where it's just a big point. So there's four types that you're going to be looking for. <clears throat> when we look at oracles, it's nice to see it under electron microscope type of image, because you can see the hairs, everything on the oracles. Um, but you can see on this other image, it's a little bit hard, but the purple in the oracles, that's a distinctive characteristic of western wheatgrass. If the oracles are purple and the collar's purple, you have western wheatgrass. Otherwise, you have northern wheatgrass. A lot of people use blue leaf or the angle of the, le of the leaves. The blue leaf only works in relative to the location. Western wheatgrass is generally bluer, but if you go on a lot of south-facing hills in the Calgary area, all the northern wheatgrass is blue as well. <clears throat> so the color doesn't really help you there because um, it's really about having them side by side for color, not just going out there and seeing a blue one because they both are different shades of bluish green. So the purple oracles really help a lot. If we're working on the sheath and how they actually overlap. So split sheath here, you can see, is open all the way down. Overlapping is the one that I find most people will mistake for closed, especially on small grasses because they'll overlap and they'll be really tight. The best way to actually determine if it's overlapping or closed is don't run your finger down from the top because if it's dry at all, it'll actually split for you and you'll actually just crack a closed sheath all the way down. If you want to actually find it out, go down halfway down the stem and try to just rub it apart and if you rub it apart in the middle, it's less likely you're going to split it. If you have a dry sample, you can split anything. But that is a lot easier to tell without um, causing damage to the plant making mistake. Boat shape tips, if you've done any of our keying courses, or pr in pretty much any other one that has to do vegetative keying, <coughs> this is probably the bane of your existence. Depending on the species, boat shape tips are very easy. Poa alpina, which we don't have here today, is very easy to see a boat shape tip because it's a really short, wide leaf. So you kind of get that. But as soon as you get into the really narrow blue grasses, a boat shape tip really does look like a pointed tip at times. What you're looking for is a keel of a canoe. So you're looking for it to be a rounding on the back. So if you take your hands and look at how they shape, you want that rounding at the tip. A lot of people will take their finger down and try to rub it and split it so it goes into a V. It works on some species, but when you get those narrow leaves, you can split anything when they're dry. So you've got to be careful there. <clears throat> there is another type of tip that 
pointed and boat shape are your common ones. There's also a blunt tip, very uncommon, but you will once in a while, they'll talk about it. And it's basically more like a pointed one, but it just kind of ends. It doesn't create that boat shaped tip, but it's a wide leaf usually. We have, so the blunt one, we have the keeled shape, but that's your boat shape. And you can see how it's rounding at the tip. And then you have the pointed one. And you can see there's still a taper on the pointed one. So it makes it challenging, but boat shaped tips are indicative of bluegrasses and a few other species. Orchard grass can have a boat shaped tip. So there's a few other things that you're gonna look for. Sweet grass, the non-reproductive stems are pointed tips, the reproductive stems are boat shaped tips. So again, knowing which part of the plant you're working with. This is the second one that's a challenge, emerging leaf. So when looking for an emerging leaf, if you have a flower head, you cannot have an emerging leaf. The emerging leaf is the top leaf coming out of the plant. As soon as there's a flower head, there's no more emerging leaves. So you go to the very top of a grass as it's coming up and you look for a, a leaf that's just coming out and you actually split it. So you use scissors, I've just broken it with my fingers, break it off at the top and look straight down on it. If it's a spiral, it's a, that's a roll leaf. If it's just a V, then it's a folded. A nice trick about this is our hard grasses, so the fescues are all folded. They call them rolled leaves, but they're a folded emerging tip. So they're folded emerging, but they're actually called a rolled leaf. So it really confuses people in terminology. But the wider and the larger the leaf is, the more likely it's going to be a rolled one. And that's generally something to pay attention to. So the, your uh, needle grasses have rolled leaves but then um, a lot of your bluegrasses don't. So it's, you have to look into the key and you can actually group whole genuses on where they fit. So root systems, my favorite is when people send me a sample of a plant and there's no root. Really makes it challenging to identify. You have to know the root system. So if you're not sending them, if you're sending photos, dig up a chunk of the root and find out what the root system is and send that information as well. You can't identify a lot of species without knowing this. So you need to know if it's stolen, rhizome, or fibrous roots. Fibrous roots are on all plants. Stolens and rhizomes are indicative of some plants. So you're not looking whether or not there's fibrous roots. You're looking at whether or not there is or is not stolons and rhizomes. <clears throat> so look for that on your grasses. There are grasses with rhizomes. There's grasses with stolons. And uh, false buffalo grass is a great example of a stoloniferous grass. So you can see here, stoloniferous grass up on the top, a fibrous root on the top, and then the rhizome in the middle. Now, are they bunched or creeping? If you have seedlings, everything is bunched. So you go out into a freshly seeded hay field. Don't expect to see rhizomes. Don't expect to see anything creeping. So know the stage the plants are at. Here on these plugs, you may find rhizomes, you may not. So ask if you aren't sure what's going on. Because when you're looking at immature plants, they don't necessarily have their rhizomes yet. If a plant has rhizomes, it can be bunched. So giant wild rye is one that it has this big tussocks. It can be about that big in diameter. And it'll stand three meters tall. But it has a rhizome that is less than a centimeter long usually. So short rhizomes exist and plants look tufted or matted. Then you have long rhizomes that actually make the plant spread out and you'll see individual stems. If you're pulling a plant up and it's an individual stem here, an individual over here, probably looking at some type of creeping root system. So you can actually look at the growth form to make inferences what the roots are doing. Good to still confirm, but it get, does help. Say Paraceae. So we're gonna be keying out some sedges, which I'm sure everybody's excited about. Um, so sed sedges, first thing to know, in grasses, they talk about a head. The head is the whole structure. When you're talking about a head in a sedge, it's actually looking more at the spikelets. So you can multiple heads per stem. So the terminology is completely different with sedges. So you have to readjust what a head is when you're getting sedges. When you're going into sedges, you're gonna be looking for stigmas. So out of the top of the seed, you're going to have two or three. So if you're in the early part of the season, you have to identify from how many st stigmas you see. If you're in the late part of the season, you can look at whether it's lens shape or a rounded seed. And that's not the prigna 
on the outside, but the actual akin in the center. So the shape of that akin down here is what you're looking at, not the perigna of the outer coating. So you can have this big round perigna and have a lens-shaped akin inside. So you have to open it up and look at what's inside. You can make some inferences if it's hard, the whole thing's hard and bloated out, it's probably the keen is filling the entire space, but not necessarily. So be checking that. <coughs> the stigmas will stay on for the whole season in some species, but they're deciduous as well. So when I'm looking at stigmas, a lot of times I'll be going around the plant counting two, 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 looking at every single set of stigmas, trying to find one with three, because they do fall off. So you find one with three, you're going three. If you don't find any with three, then you're going two. So you're not looking for just the first one you look at. You have to look around the whole plant. The perigna also can have ribbing, and it'll be same with grasses. So you'll have to count how many of those ribs there are along this perigna. So solitary spike versus multiple spikes. So the idea of the heads in grasses, the spikes in, in the grass, you have a solitary one, it means you have one set. Where you can see over on this other one, you actually have multiple spikes. Androgynous versus gynecandrous, that's going to be the next big issue that you're going to be looking at. And androgynous means you have, down here is the female and the top is the male. So the top is you got the anthers falling down and the stigmas are all on the female part. You need to be looking at where the stigmas are showing up, they're not going to show up everywhere. You can also have, uh, on the other side, the gynecandrus, where the anthers are all pop coming down on the bottom and the stigmas are on the top. So there's your male, female, versus male and female. So the next thing is the beak. If the beak is cleft, so you, have, you can see here a nice cleft beak, and they can come in different shapes, different sizes, you have to note it. Even if it's a tiny little one, you have to know if it's cleft. The beak in itself is just if it has a pointed tip. So that, there's no cleft in the beak on this other one, but it does have a beak, that little tip coming off the perigna. So, winged margins. You can see it from one side, you can't see it from the other side. Winged margin just means you have a papery edge around the side of the, the perigna. Fairly easy to see it on big seeds, very difficult on some of the smaller ones. And the other thing they'll ask is, is it white pitted? So basically, is there a little tiny white indents into it? So there are things that you really want to have a good hand lens. I recommend with sedges a 20 power minimum for hand lenses. Uh, 10 power can get you through the big stuff, but when you get to the small ones, really you want to get up to uh, somewhere closer to a 20 power lens. So Iliocaris, another whole family group. Um, the tubercle is what you're going to be looking for. You can see it has a nice uh, a keen lens shaped and then it has those little bristles up it and then the different shapes of the tubercle and the sizes will actually identify the species apart. Again, you feel like you want to have a microscope. These are small, small parts. And now we're going to be jumping back into our die cots. So there's a lot of different die cots to work with. And what we're going to be working with is Celionaceae, which is your poplar and your willows. And poplar is something that they're very similar to willows, and they cross as much as willows. So aspen, balsam, people know some of the cottonwoods, and they do all cross with each other. So something we don't usually pay attention to, but there is a lot of crossing, especially when you get down to the cottonwoods. You see it very pronounced all the time. You don't see aspen and balsam as often. So starting here, we're going to be looking at the perianth, which is absent, or, or a single series appendages. Flowers, imperfect, and in catkins, so male-female separation. And reproductive morphology, you have monaceous, which is your Celinaceae. So getting into this, here's your terminology you need to know. So for reproductive, catkin, stigma, style, capsules, glands, beak, stipe. That's the basic, what we're going to be going through is the second part today, which is, is it glaucous? Which is if you have a powdery, um, a lot of times it is a bluish white type powdery um, surface on the leaf. Um, it's not talking about glabrous, which is hair or no hair. So glaucous and glabrous are different. 
So glabrous and pubescent refers to hair. Glaucus is a powdery type of surface. The best way to find glaucus is you rub the leaf and it'll change and very lightly and you'll see you'll scrape it off and it'll actually change color. If you rub any leaf really hard, you're going to change the color by you're going to be crushing the cells and that changes the color. So this is doing it very lightly so you're not crushing the cells. So getting into the next things, is it toothed? So the edge of the leaves are they toothed? And is there glands in those tooth? There will be yellow glands or black glands. And you'll see this little, um, under a hand lens, you'll see kind of this shiny little um, gland that's goldish or blackish, depending on the plant that actually sits in the teeth or in other parts of the stem on the plant. Um, when you look at your dwarf birch or bog birch, there's glands all over the stems on those plants. So they're really good to look at. Um, then you're looking at, are they creeping, stoloniferous, um, and ruagos and revolute are my other favorite ones. So re revolute is whether you got the edge of the leaves in turning, so they kind of curl. Um, and ruagos is when you have actually the veins indented in and popping out the bottom. So uh, you can actually tell the species of, of some willows by seeing that indented. And we'll show you that because we've got plants with the uh, rugose. I don't think we have anything with Revolute today, but the rugose we do have. <clears throat> so getting back into looking reproductive structures, this just shows you a little bit of what we're going to be, what you can be dealing with. I'm not going to go through it in detail because we're not focusing today on it. So stipule, something I want you to really, really pay attention to is the stipule is here on the edge of the stem or the leaf. The big issue with the stipule is it does not look like a leaf. It's not a bud. And a lot of people will look at a bud coming out, so they'll have a leaf coming out and they'll look at it and find a little bud. That's not a stipule. So the stipule is a little leaf. On plants that are cut off um, recently, freshly growing, they will have much bigger stipules. So if there's been damage to the plant, the stipules will be much bigger than normal. So note the plant you're looking at. Is it mature? Is it in its normal growth form or is it stressed and growing at a different form? Willows, the leaf shape, everything changes when they're under stress. So if you have a big willow that's been knocked over and you have a bunch of new shoots coming up, or if it's been mowed off and the new shoots are coming up, the leaves are going to be a different shape, usually much bigger than normal, and the characteristics will be a little bit different. On I guess the gland, you can see a little brown gland there. You also have to know the shape of your leaves. Linear is going to be important. And then you'll have ones where they'll mix these around and say linear um, lanceolate or something like that. You, so you have to be able to take each one of these and they'll actually mix terms together because they'll have a variation in between. But you need to know what elliptic is, obovate, ovate, those are kind of the main ones, and lanceolate. Getting into the other <coughs> dicots, you have to know pretty much all of them. So here's in willows. You have obovate, elliptic, chordate, oblong, lanceolate, and then linear. And each one of those is indicative of either a species or a group of species. Here's your ragose, where you can see the veins are actually inset inward. Until you've seen this, it's hard to actually imagine what it looks like. So the best is to actually to see each one of these characteristics before you try to key them out. Because it's really easy to trick yourself into seeing something like this. Revolute is the incurling, and you can actually see a little on the back of the leaf. You can see on the edge is just a little bit at the top of the leaf. Glaucus, and it's going to be beneath or on both sides. And you can see the different color from top to bottom. And that's where you want to test and make sure it's not hair that's calling, making the different color, but it's actually that it's glaucous. And there's a tooth margin one with not, and it's generally that one's got glands and is not glaucous. So willows, they do cross, so you're going to be looking for the most likely. So you'll be narrowing down to two parents a lot of times. So when you're out in the environment having to identify what you've got, you look around, find pure ones that you can identify, and then from the pure ones, you can assess generally that there's other ones that are going to be crosses of those pure ones. 
So you're going to have mixtures. There's certain ones, Sandbar Willow, that I have not seen cross before. Um, but there are many of the other ones cross. And then note about the damaged plants do not regenerate in the same way. 